So I want to welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Grand Round session. Today is June 9th. For those who would wish to claim CME credit, the event code for today is 160047. Um, you can register for that credit uh, several different ways listed here. Um, but if you are having any issues, please be sure to contact them or you may contact myself as well. But you'll want to make sure that you do that before midnight tonight in order to receive your credit. So we want to thank everybody for muting your microphone as we get started here. Also, please remember to remain attentive and engaged in the session. Dr. Han has mentioned that we will take questions throughout the session. If you could just put those in the chat box and then once he's finished, we will go ahead and look through those. But also at the end of the presentation today, I'll be um, posting the link for the evaluation so that we can give him our feedback. So please help us out with that. And this is a South Texas Medical, I'm sorry, South Texas Regional Family Medicine Grand Rounds, and we are partnered with the South Central AHEC, um, meeting our mission statement of inventing a healthier future for families and communities in San Antonio, South Texas, and beyond through excellence in patient-centered care, research, and education. If you are interested in seeing your CME transcript, please be sure to go to the CME website listed there, and you may choose the option to view your transcript. Um, you can also print that if you need to, but if you have questions, please contact them or contact myself. Those who are also interested in members of the AAFP, we do uh, prescribe one credit for this session today. So be sure to check that out if you need credit through the AAFP and you can contact them at the number listed or their website. Dr. Han has disclosed he receives royalties from up to date for being editor in chief for general practice and family medicine. So without further ado, I will let him go ahead and get started. Dr. Han. Thank you, Nicole. Good afternoon. I am delighted to have the opportunity to be before you. And I am excited to be able to present to you uh, a report that was just released on May 4th, may the 4th be with you, and really related to the implementing high quality primary care. The learning objectives that I'm, we're trying to focus here is we're gonna review the key findings and recommendations from the report implementing high quality primary care from the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. And we would then identify some policy action steps to support the implementation of high quality primary care. This report is um, available from the National Academy of, of Medicine. And uh, it's, it's a long read, but I highly recommend it. I think it's, an, uh, it's, an it's a wonderful analysis of the current situation, but also gives us some guidance as I will highlight in a few minutes. The, this report was put together by a committee that included um, individuals from different ex expertise, uh, including clinicians, uh, family medicine, internal medicine, uh, to pediatrics, nurses, uh, dentists, clinical uh, physician assistants, community health worker uh, imp implementation folks, we had a health center CEO. Uh, we had a state and federal health policy experts, an economist, medical and cultural anthropologist, and sociologist. I'm sorry, I keep saying we. I wasn't part of the committee. I just had the, the privilege of being one of the reviewers. Uh, the report uh, had a broad coalition of professional societies, federal agencies, and private foundations that supported the, the report. And the, the, the process or the uh, rather the implementation plan considers the barriers and enablers for innovation, a comprehensive integration to address the needs of individuals, families, and communities, a primary care's role in achieving population health outcomes and equity goals, uh, team-based interprofessional practice in the range of primary care providers, the evolving role of technologic, technological and other innovations. Uh, it really it looks at education and training needs for the changing workforce, the evolution and sustainability of a variety of 
care delivery and payment models, approaches to meaningful measurement of improvement and improvement of care quality, the primary care needs for different populations, including rural and other underserved communities, behavioral and social determinants of health and community oriented whole person care and the infrastructure needed for evaluation and data information decision making. It's a mouthful and I'll try to take that apart as we discuss some of the key findings. Um, the committee process was five meetings. They have public public information gathering sessions, they had commissioned papers. They had a very extensive literature review, over 6,000 articles and synthesis of findings and, and inclusions. And the recommendations were given, driven by consensus. And like I mentioned, there was an external review by 16 experts in a variety of disciplines. So the COVID pandemic and the longstanding health inequity demonstrate how important primary care is in the United States. Primary care provides comprehensive person-centered health care for individuals, families, and communities. Countries where, with high quality primary care experience, better health outcomes and greater health equity. Primary care is a, in the US is financially under resourced and lacks a unified voice in the health and human service arena. Primary care is inaccessible for a large portion of the population. And visits to primary care are in decline and the workforce is shrinking. Primary care workforce shortages can be linked to reduced life expectancy. In fact, primary care is the only sector or the only part of the, public, of the healthcare sector where directly can be related to produce more equity when it's done in a better way. Um, it, this, this is a, a figure that looks at the number of visits in the, in the proportion of expenditures in medical care. This is uh, data that is coming from the, from the medical expenditure uh, national survey and, um, and they include direct payments for care. And as you can see, 35% of visits uh, are to, uh, of the visits in medical care are to primary care, but only 5% only of, of the expenditures are there. Specialty care is 35% of the visits, but 17% of the expenditures are going towards non-primary care and in the hospital, inpatient visits are only 3%, but 26% of the expenses are going there. Um, in this case, the primary care data includes physicians in family medicine, general practice, geriatrics, general internal medicine, and general pediatrics only. Nurse practitioners and physician assistants um, and midwife data were not broken down by setting and are not represented in this graph. So the, sh the share of, so under investment leads to health inequity, financial pressures on practices, clinician burnout and suboptimal care, including erosion of life expectancy gains in the last hundred years. The COVID pandemic has been, made this even more as amplified as we have known for our own experience caring for our patients, uh, have amplified economic mental health and social inequities, they exacerbated access for, to care for problems and financial pressures to practice. And although some meaningful changes, including relaxation of telehealth rules were implemented, our primary care has been neglected as a, as a distributor of vaccines in the, in the context of what is going on during the pandemic. One of the things that um, the committee did is they did an updated definition of uh, primary care as high quality. Primary care is the provision of whole person integrated, accessible and equitable health care by interprofessional teams that are accountable for addressing the majority of an individual's health and wellness needs across settings and through sustained relationship with patients, families, and communities. This definition reflects some of the societal changes that have 
come to us since the last primary care uh, report that was produced by the National Academy of Medicine in 1996. We have a shift from provision of services to integrated full person health. We have it as a foundational sustained relationship at the core, the importance of communities and their roles in the provision of high quality primary care, the need of primary care to be equitable in the interprofessional care teams that deliver primary care in the diversity of settings and modalities used to deliver primary care. One of the key findings or, or the key recommendations from the report is the, the, the sense that primary care is a common good. And the way I would think I would talk about this is a common good like use of a highway of public education. A common good is uh, it's rivers, meaning that it's limited. So more for one person means less for another, but it's also non-excludable meaning that users cannot be prevented from accessing it regardless of whether they have paid. The committee strongly believe that because it is a societal value that is designed for everyone to use throughout their lives, primary care deserves to be treated as a common good. And that committee believes that its implementation plan will elevate primary care to the common good status it deserves and that the country needs. Patient choice is important, but we are not going to compete our way to a stronger role in primary care in our delivery system any more than we will compete our way to a stronger elementary or secondary education system. So it requires public policy for oversight and monitoring. It needs a strong advocacy, organized leadership and public awareness. The committee's implementation plan builds on three element implementation uh, strategy. An implementation framework with three levels of change that accounts for the complexity of the US healthcare system. A macro level that is government and policy, a meso level that is health systems, and a micro level that is practice and delivery level. An accountability framework that establishes a structure and process for assessing the adequacy and completeness of the implementation and a public policy framework that prioritizes developing government policy to implement high quality primary care consistent with its status as a common good. The implementation phases are planning, adoption, and scaling, and they are reflected in the report. The report uh, then talks about five objectives for achieving high quality primary care. These objectives are in payment, workforce, access, digital health, and accountability. The, the committee's recommend, recommended actions that make, makes up its implementation plan six to achieve five major objectives. Pay for primary care teams to care for people, not doctors to deliver services. The nation, the nation gets what it pays for and payment reform that supports and encourages high quality primary care rather than actively discouraging it is fundamental to the committee's vision of a high quality primary care. Without payment reform, none of the things that we're talking about are possible. The second objective is to ensure that high quality primary care is available to every individual and family in every community. Everyone in the country should have a easy access to high quality primary care that is person-centered, relationship-oriented, and responsive to the needs of the community. We also train, need to train primary care teams where people live and work. When primary care training is interprofessional and located in community settings, it is more effective at developing the skills that will keep people connected and healthy. We also need to de design information technology that serves the patient, family, and interprofessional care teams. New health information technology standards should be prioritized and facilitate integrated care that is person-centered, supports relationships, and is responsive to the needs of the community. I will be expanding in each of these uh, objectives in a, in a second. Uh, and then the, the fifth one is to ensure that high quality primary care is implemented in the United States. 
Implementing high quality primary care requires clear and meaningful measures of whole person care, ongoing research and leadership in the federal government to assure federal policy support its development. So let's, let's, let's take a closer look at the first objective. Pay for primary care teams to care for people, not doctors to deliver services. Payers should evaluate and disseminate payment models based on their ability to promote the delivery of high quality care, primary care, not short term cost savings. Up to this point, we have tried to make the argument that primary care is good because it saves money to the system. That may be true or not, but the reality is that primary care produces more equity and reduces early mortality consistently when it's placed. So Medicaid, Medicare, commercial insurers, and self-insured employees should evaluate and disseminate payment models based on the ability of those models to promote the delivery of high quality primary care and not their ability to achieve short-term cost savings. Payers, again, Medicaid, Medicare, commercial insurance, and self-insured employers using a fee-for-service model payment for primary care should shift primary care payment towards hybrid, part fee-for-service, part capitated reimbursement models, making them the default method for paying for primary care teams. For risk-bearing contracts with population-based health and cost accountability, such as those with accountable care organizations, payers should assure the sufficient resources and incentives flow to primary care. Hybrid reimbursement models should pay prospectively for interprofessional integrated team-based care, including incentives for incorporating non-clinician team members and for partnerships with community-based organizations. I think that this applies to the model that we use at the, at the Family Health Center, where we are integrating non-clinician team members very effectively with our promotores and all the parts of the advanced primary care team. Uh, we, the prospective, they need to be risk adjusted for medical and social complexity. We experience in the Family Health Center high levels of social complexity and medical complexity, and the payments need to reflect that reality. And you need to allow for investment in team development, practice transformation, and the infrastructure to design, use, and maintain necessary digital health technology. And we need to align with incentives for measuring improving outcomes for attributed populations. CMS should increase the overall proportion of healthcare spending to primary care by improving Medicare fee for service and restoring the drug to advisory nature. Uh, Dr. Lower reminded us that uh, recently in, in a communication that I had with him that um, the, the importance of the rock for those of you who are not know what it is, uh, is the relative value scale update committee. It's a committee that provides value to the different uh, work I use and different procedures and it has a relatively low representation of primary care clinicians. Part of, one of the recommendations is to restoring the relative value scale update committee to an advisory nature, as was originally intended by developing and relying on additional independent expert panels and evidence derived directly from practice. And there is an important, it's, an, it's important of, to accelerate the efforts to improve the accuracy of the physician fee schedule by developing better data collection and evaluation to identify overpriced services with a goal of increasing payment uh, rates in other connections. Paying for primary care teams then is a transition from full fee for service uh, that it will be phased out to risk adjusted capitation plus fee for service by patient assignment to the full payments for primary care, re-evaluated e &M codes and resources for transformation. And, you know, having then risk bearing contracts with focus on population health with sufficient resources and incentives for primary care. The second objective is related to uh, 
access. And um, and the recommendation here is that we need to facilitate the ongoing primary care relationship. All individuals who have the opportunity to have a one, a usual source of care. And payers need to be covering individuals to need to ask cover individuals to declare a usual source of care or primary care annually and should assign non-responding and release with established methods track this information and use it for payment and accountability measures. Health centers, hospitals, and primary care practices should assume and document an ongoing clinical relationship with the uninsured people they are treating. We need to improve access to high quality primary care for underserved populations and facilitate empanelment of uninsured people. Health and human services enable by congressional appropriation should target sustained investment in the creation of new health centers, including federally qualified health centers and school-based health centers and rural health clinics in the Indian Health Service this, uh, facilities to designated for shortage areas. To improve access to high quality care services for Medicaid beneficiaries, CMS should revise access standards for primary care for Medicaid beneficiaries and provide resources to state Medicaid agencies for these changes. CMS should permanently support COVID era rule revisions and primary care practices should include community members in governance, design and delivery and partner with community based organizations. Some of the steps, particularly the last one there, we have included in the in in the in the design in how the family health center uh, is uh, organized in terms of the, the patient and family uh, uh, council. Number three is the trained primary care teams where people live and work. Healthcare organizations who strive to 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 diversify the primary care workforce and customize teams to meet the needs of the populations that serve. Government agencies should expand educational pipeline models and improve economic incentive. CMS, the VA, HRSA, and states should redeploy and augment Title VII, Title VIII, and GME funding to support interprofessional training in community-based primary care environments. So design information technology that preserves the patient family interprofessional care team. I don't know about you, but in my, in my experience, electronic health records are mostly there to serve the payers, not the patients, although things are changing a bit. The office of uh, the ONC, the, the office of the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology and CMS to develop next phase of digital health certification standards that support relationship-based continuous and person-centered care, simplify the user experience and ensure equitable access and use and holds vendors accountable. Right now, if something is not working, the clinicians are accountable, but really we should shift that to the vendors and the designers of the houses of the electronic health records to, to have that responsibility to make sure that actually they do what they are intended to do. And ONC and CMS should, should adopt a comprehensive aggregate patient data system that is usable by any certified digital debt tool for patients, families, clinicians, and care team members. So there should be access and uh, a comprehensive data that is available for uh, the different groups to make sure that we uh, do it. The, this data source needs to be usable by any um, in, in, in should accomplish this through a centralized data warehouse, individual data card or distributed sources connected by a real life functional health information exchange. Each approach has its own challenges and its initial efforts should decide the right in national approach. The fifth uh, ob objective is to ensure high quality primary care is implemented in the United States. Here is a very concrete recommendation. Um, the Health and Human Service Secretary should establish a Secretary's Council on Primary Care 
to coordinate primary care policy to ensure adequate budgetary resources for such work and report to Congress and the public on progress and hear guidance and recommendations for a primary care advisory committee that represents key primary care stakeholders. Right now in the federal government, there is no unified uh, authority to coordinate and ensure that primary care gets, gets um, deployed. Uh, it, the council should include uh, the directors of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Center, HRSA, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, HSA, and the National Coordinator of ONC. The council really should coordinate primary care policy across the different agencies to assess that the federal primary care payment is sufficient and the policies are aligned. And then it also needs to monitor to primary care workforce efficiency, including training, finance, and in production to make sure that we are online to, to be able to support the high quality primary care that we're trying to implement. Uh, we need to promote alignment of public and private payer policies in support of high quality primary care and to establish meaningful metrics for assessing the quality of primary care uh, that embraces person-centeredness and health quality equity goals. As part of this coordination, the Secretary's Council should verify adequate budgetary resources are allotted in, resp in respective agencies for fulfilling this responsibility. The Secretary's Council should annually report to Congress and in public on the progress of the implementation of this, uh, this effort. HHS should also form an Office of Primary Care Research and NIH and prioritize funding of primary care research. The uh, committee recommends that this be uh, an important aspect of the uh, allowing the ability to create knowledge that will support primary care research. Uh, and uh, the primary care professional societies, consumer groups and philanthropies should assemble regularly to comply uh, and disseminate, compile and disseminate a high quality primary care implementation scorecard to improve accountability and implementation. And this scorecard uh, intends to to help track implementation progress, what elements are in place, uh, is to hold actors identify accountable for implementing the steps necessary for high quality primary care. The committee proposes suggested measures for this scorecard, including the following principles. Measures should be previously developed as opposed to propose new measures. They should be few, easily understood by the general public and consistent over time. It should be reliant on data collected regularly, comprehensively, and reliably for producing assessments and a relevant scope of, or geography, preferably data that will be publicly available and non-proprietary. And it, could be, it should be an accountable unit. The measure should, not, should be available at the national and state levels so that we can engage as advocates in, 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 in monitoring the progress of implementation of high quality primary care. So um, I have done a really, I have sort of very quickly presented some of the highlights of this report that is pretty extensive. And uh, having done that, I'm going to I uh, stopped sharing my screen and I'm happy to dialogue with you in terms of some of the, your reaction to what uh, have been presented, some of the things that are being um, proposed and, and I'm looking for your, your reaction. Do you want me to read the, the question in the chat here, Dr. Hyan? It uh, looks like we have one from Patricia Fagan. I'll, I'll read it. Okay. In federal programs in the state of Texas, the majority of our telehealth visits are not permitted under the existing rules without an executive orders suspended or rule, et cetera, allow us to provide better access. Yeah, so are there efforts to petition keeping current rules for providing better access to services? Yeah, uh, 
that would be that's one of the things that was one of the benefits in some ways for from the COVID pandemic. It's not a, a rule that has changed dramatically. Again, I think the, the focus of the report and the focus of the implementation is not so much into a uh, um, piecemeal approach, but rather a comprehensive approach related to incrementing quality of primary care and things Things like this um, are going to be important pieces of what is being proposed going forward. Um, they kind of all ask, where does this go next? So we, um, or I think there, there's efforts uh, to to establish that the secretary's council is is going to be a, a very critical point. It, 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 it turns out that you don't need congressional authorization to create such a council because it can be done in the same authorization that the Office of National uh, of the IT Office was created. Uh, right now, uh, there seems to be interest from the Secretary of Health and Human Services where uh, I, I think this is one place where you could be involved uh, as we are uh, pushing for that in terms of providing uh, support and encouragement, because again, primary care is the only part of this, the only sector, the only part of the healthcare sector that where more produces more equity and longer lives. No one else can make that claim. Carlos, uh I'm not sure this is, this is Mark. Uh, I'm not sure that it's addressed in the report, but can you make some comments about time frame? How, uh, what kind of a timetable you think uh, would be feasible, desirable? Because obviously there's a lot of training goals and other things that require some lead time. Um, I, I, I think that it needs to evolve. And needs to, I, I think this needs to be an impetus let me, let, me, let me back off for a minute. In 1996, there was a terrific uh, primary care report that was published by the National Academy of Medicine and went nowhere. The context was that it was done around the time when the Clintons were trying to pass a health care plan and that just kind of imploded. In this situation, I think that the, the focus of that report is significantly more specific about implementation and it's specific about when to do it. And I think that, you know, we do it as, all, as soon as we can, but I think it's, it's, it's gonna take time, it's gonna take effort. And really uh, some of the shifting of the, um, for example, the, uh, the, the specific uh, goal related to um, training, uh, some of it is going to be supporting what we have. Some of it might be expansions. It really depends on where the needs are. And, and, and the idea is that then we want to train. Uh, I think the idea there is you want to train primary care clinicians as close as you can to the communities that will serve. And they're much more likely to stay like our residents have demonstrated over the decades in the communities where they get trained and, and I think that's one of the efforts. But more resources are necessary. The, the 5% of the uh, healthcare expenses where the, the rest of the developed countries do, uh, spend about 16% of their uh, healthcare expenses in primary care, we're down to five. So that needs to dramatically change in, in, in a way that makes sense. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Mark. Uh, no, I appreciate the, uh, the thoughts. I mean, it's, it's almost an impossible question because who knows, you know, when we'll have the political will and the money, et cetera, to do that. But I appreciate your thoughts. Uh, Dr. Obite, uh says how we, primary care community, help clinics understand the importance of high quality primary care. To actually walk this out, we have known many of the items discussed in that report for some time, and yet few clinics actually could be classified as offering high quality primary care in the communities. Excellent point. I think that, you know, part of what we need to do is we need to create a demand. I, I think is 
it's a multifactorial effort. Uh, I think on our part, as we are training our residents and you residents as you're graduating, you need to be willing to demand high elements of high quality primary care. I, it's my understanding uh, from uh, talking to some of the folks in the, in the family health center that when residents interview and they make demands or they, they talk about our clinic, uh, there are changes that can happen because of that process. So I think it's in part is the inside, but it's also an outside pros prospect in terms of uh, measuring high quality, expecting high quality and pushing high quality as we go forward. Um, a link to the report, let me see. I tried oh. to add it there for you. Uh, well, what was on the last slide, if you have another link, I can share it in an email out uh, to everybody after the meeting, but. Okay, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. I think that that will be helpful. Um, uh, Maria Avelanets, welcome back. Any measures to counteract challenges like access, knowledge regarding internet, computer, vulnerable populations, minorities, low income? Yeah, so, you know, again, part of the issue is this is part of a comprehensive approach. Uh, the, the digital infrastructure needs to be built along with roads and bridges. Um, I think that the the effort or the recommendation that is specific for IT pushes hard on the notion that we need to have systems that are responsive to patients, families, clinicians, and, and communities of need. So yes, I think uh, there is a push to really change the expectations and change the process and how in terms of how that makes that happens. Uh, I'll be interesting to hear, uh, maybe you can unmute your microphones, any of the third years, particularly as you're going into the, or a, but any, anyone presenting here, how do you see this potentially being implemented? And how do you, does that resonate with you in terms of what it could be and what could happen in the context of our lifetime? Well, I know some of you, so do you, would you like me to call on you? Would that be easier? Dr. Haiyan, I have a quick question for you as the department chair. This is Yun. Um, what do you envision of transforming our clinic or residency program towards that goal? Thank you, Yun. This is an, that's an excellent question. We have been doing that for the last seven years, from my perspective, or maybe more, maybe for the last 10 years, we have been on a journey. And uh, for me, transformation is really, uh, it's a journey of mastery. So we never really get there, but we can get on the way. And many of the elements that we have in place at the Family Health Center, in terms of the, the extensive team, the um, multidisciplinary team, the training and the ability to make it work are elements, but the payment models and the ways of supporting are not there yet. Uh, I think we need to be advocates um, and we need to be able to implement it in a way that that makes sense. But I, I'll be interested, I, what, do you, what do you think? How does that, what pieces do you see there that may, may be in a different direction? Um, from the peer perspective, I, I have <laughs> not too much knowledge about what, what they can do. It sounds like all might be a top-down approach. It has to be coming from the policymakers. That's what I'm looking. I don't know too much about it. Yeah. So, I, I actually part of the the second objective that I'm trying to do is to get you engage all of you. Because I think that if you're if you're here in this session, you probably are, you have some interest in primary care and particularly pushing it, and you may have a deep appreciation of the value of what 
primary care is for your patients, for our communities, and for equity. So then I think that having a vision that says, no, fee-for-service is not the only way to go forward. In fact, if you're fee-for-service, you're practicing in the 20th century, and we're now in the second decade of the 21st century. Uh, we need to find ways to get capitation so that we can build a team that more appropriately respond to the needs of our community. Um, that advocacy doesn't have to be top down. That advocacy can have in the con can happen in the context of uh, the uh, uh, the in the morning huddles. That can happen in the context of you're negotiating with a uh, with a new job. Uh, that advocacy can happen in the context of uh, meeting and trying to reorganize the resources that you have. And I think the important piece is to keep in mind that as primary care clinicians and leaders, we have the opportunity to set the agenda and to really disseminate in getting engaged. So many, for example, many uh, primary care clinics in, in San Antonio that are, uh, they're claiming that are serving communities similar to the one we serve at the Family Health Center lack a very robust uh, behavioral health consultant services. So they may have, they may lack integrated uh, community health workers, or they may, may not have ways to develop different components. And we, in some ways, from my perspective, have a responsibility to help disseminate the, the information, the learning that we're doing and finding ways so that other people around us. So we, I think it's important not to act locally and, and really bring what we're learning uh, to the, the places where we practice in, in ways that are uh, real and tangible so people can see the benefit of, uh, of, of high quality primary care. Thank you, Dr. Ayan. You're welcome. I, I get your point. Carlos is Byron. I, I threw a question out there about, you know, don't want to get off track, but um, has there been any industry collaboration, you know, with our accountable care organizations, you know, Valero or USAID, so we could help drive this uh, appropriate change and needed? Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Um, yeah, I, not necessarily at the local level yet, but at the national level, there are, um, if we, we looked at the, uh, the different groups that were engaged initially, um, there are several who are interested in, in, particip in participating um, uh, as sponsors. Um, and, and I think that there's the, uh, there's the opportunity definitely to have uh, partnerships with local, uh, 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 with local partners. So I think it's, you know, it sort of needs to be an all in full core press, frankly, to do it. And, and I am a part of a group that is uh, the research centers in family medicine across the nation. And we are preparing, uh, you know, some of the members of the committee are gonna be meeting with uh, the highest level of the HSS but it's also getting the word out and validating and connecting. And it's really a good opportunity to highlight that. And I think it, you know, one of the things we can do is we can put our heads together and say, how can we, maybe that's a different session, but how can we, what can we do here locally together to move the, the needle in that direction? I agree. So I, I thank you for a challenge, Dr. Hepburn. Well, let's let's try to put a, a group together to at least highlight it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. okay. Carlos, piggybacking on what 
Byron brought up in, in Seattle is my understanding that Boeing has gone straight with primary care centers where the primary care centers provide their their primary health care to their workers, totally bypassing the insurance companies, if I understand correctly. And that was thought by some to be a nice pilot program that might be used to show the government how this could work. <clears throat> so I have sort of two questions. To your knowledge, is there anyone here in San Antonio like HEB or other large employers who are working straight with primary care centers to provide primary health care? <clears throat> and to, to your knowledge, have those uh, situations like Boeing in Seattle, have those been looked at by the government as possible pilot programs to see what they could accomplish with capitated primary care for, for the general population? Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, so I think that, you know, what you are highlighting are some direct primary care, it's called sort of the, you don't have a intermediary and then you pay directly for, for primary care and connections and there is a pretty extensive uh, discussion of that model in the payment uh, chapter. And, you know, I think that the more details can be gathered from there. As far as uh, locally, yes, HEV actually has uh, primary care clinics. And um, I'm not sure they're, at this point, I don't think they are for all their employees, but I do know that there's uh, several clinics that they run that they provide uh, primary care uh, services. I, I, I know that at least to their truckers and others um, in, in terms of that process. Uh, yes, they, but they, even though they're contracting to other folks, but they are really in the process. They're not, uh, I mean, essentially they have a company that comes in and does the work for them, but they're paying that, that contractor directly. Thanks. Okay, any other questions or comments? So Patricia, maybe you know more about this HEV situation if you want to expand. Sorry, it took me a minute to unmute myself. Um, I, I've been working out, so I've, I've left my camera off to spare you the vision. <laughs> And, uh, yes, HEB um, actually has on-site clinics in their major warehouse, and uh, that's for all employees to use if they wish, but it's most convenient to the employees who work at the warehouse, and they also provide the, um, I'm not certain if they're providing those DOT physicals for their very large fleet and, uh, uh, and uh, posse of truck drivers. There are organizations in San Antonio, the, the biggest one that I know of is a direct care model, it's Direct Med Clinic. They actually provide on-site clinics to mostly mid to small size employers. You know, we have a, a factory in San Antonio that has about 400 employees. Um, they have a, um, the, the, this particular model is very suited for these small organizations that have a self-funded you know, rather than a um, rather self-funded um, health insurance, if you will, it's not even really insurance. It, it's all self-funded by the employer and they pay an intermediary to settle those claims. But these clinics are used as a, um, as a service to provide service on site to the employees and their families uh, to keep the cost low because the people in that clinic are aware of what their coverage issues are. And the, it reduces the absenteeism as the employee, you know, if they're getting their blood pressure treated, they can just on their break, they can just go by the clinic for their appointment to uh, get their lab work, get their examination, that sort of thing. Also for uh, acute illnesses. And um, that, that particular model does really, it, it works well for um, a self-funded uh, employer. And so I, I found that interesting. HEB is also self-funded. They don't have a, they have a, oh, somebody who pays their claims, kind of like what 
uh, like TRS and Aetna, the, the teacher's retirement system, they don't really have Aetna coverage. Aetna just manages that money. That These are the types of uh, uh, employers yeah. who are doing this. And it's it tends to work very well for them. The uh, The costs tend to go down, the quality is, is up. And then there's people who are, the, the, the employees are very satisfied that they don't have to leave work. USAA has a similar arrangement too with a, a much larger contractor. Um, they, they are of course a much larger employer. And uh, so it's, I've kind of been dabbling out in that business a little bit before coming to UT Health. And so I have a lot of direct experience with them. And uh, I, I found it to be a, a very good model and the, uh, the employees like it, um, they're satisfied with it. and. And that, that is something to expand looking at the, the larger population. Thank you. And, and, I, and I, I think that's a very important point. UT system itself is self-funded, but we're not there yet. But I, 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 want, I want you to take away two things. One, primary care is a common good, like, high, like public education and highways. We need to treat it like that and not treat it just for those who can afford it, because I think everyone needs to have good, high quality primary care. And secondly, you have to, we have to keep in mind that in the long run, it's not really about what primary care saves, but what primary care does for equity and for longevity and quality of health in, in life. So with those two comments, unless there's any other questions, I will give you back 10 minutes. And thank you so much for coming to participate. Carlos, over the past, this is Ross again. Over the past 40 years, uh, <clears throat> we've tried to look at how do we increase the number of students going into family medicine? or primary care. And most of the internal medicine folks go into specialty. So I'm talking about family medicine again. Uh, <clears throat> and we've tried everything that I can think of and most people I know of can think of to try to influence students to go into family medicine. Um, <clears throat> and one student that I spoke to her father was a primary or family physician, I think in Uvalde. Um, and we were talking one day and <clears throat> so I talked to her about what she was gonna do and she was gonna go into some specialty. And I said, and I just told her, your, your mind is, works like a family physician. You have the attitude for a family physician. You have all the qualities of a family physician. Your dad's a family physician. What's keeping you from going to the family practice? And she said, Dr. Lawler, I can't afford it. I need to go into a specialty that pays more to pay back my loans. Is there any acknowledgement at a national level of the fact that somehow the <clears throat> reimbursement for primary care needs to go up in order to compete for students to go into primary care? that our reimbursement needs to come closer to the specialty reimbursement? Yes, I mean, made several of the objectives of the, of the plan address that in terms of the uh, changing of the reimbursement in, the, in how, uh, the, how the RUC in, 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 the, in the appreciation and the moving to pay more for primary care. I think that, uh, I think it's a whole package. It's not just a single solution. I don't think there is a, a magic bullet, but if you have a robust primary care, you have practices in, in a nation that the values, supports, and builds high quality primary care. Uh, there are so many rewards in the context and there are so many potential ways of addressing um, whether it's uh, medical education loans or other components, that I think it's important to look at the, at the whole system answer rather than individual pieces. Because I think if we, we spend too much time in the individual pieces, we lose sight of the fact 
And this is the only uh, developed country where uh, primary care is so underfunded and we are not able to do it. So the funding of primary care is not only to increase the teams, but it's really to recognize the whole package to find ways to make it work. And I don't think it's going to be individual changes, but it's, it needs to be comprehensive and clearly monitor in, in, in knowing that we are moving in that direction. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, well, thank you again. Have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Hayan, and thank you everybody for joining us.